Hi, Lou here with part two of Digital Game Pricing. I mentioned at the end of part one the tragedy of the commons. This is the case where each person doing what is in his or her self-interest acts in a way that results in a disaster for society as a whole. I believe the title came from the common pasture land that villages would have in England especially where everybody would let their animals graze on the land until the land was effectively destroyed. Each person wanted to do the best for themselves by letting their animals graze on free land in effect, but it destroyed the land. Each developer, in the case of games, in his own self-interest accepts sales at big discounts in order to get more money. We can ask, if he doesn't do that, will people buy his full price stuff after the first few months? Rarely, unfortunately. This is a consequence of the internet age. It costs nothing to make an additional copy of the game. Uh, it costs almost nothing to sell it, especially through bundles. So the publishers are willing to put their games in the bundles at vastly reduced prices in effect. This hasn't happened in tabletop games because Every copy made costs significant money. Now, I find that online non-credit courses are tending to work the same way. I teach, have devised and teach a large number of online self-paced non-degree courses at sites like Udemy. Millions of people visit such sites every month. The instructors are independent contractors. Udemy regularly runs what I call kamikaze marketing, as little as $10 for a $299 course. None of my courses cost more than $45 or $50, but there are people who inflate their prices and then let them be sold for $10 because they think people are more likely to buy the supposed $299 course than a $50 course at $10. Most of the instructors participate, I don't. I wanted to make sure that my classes won't be offered at lower than about 20% off because I don't want to devalue the work I put into the courses. But that's not how people think in that get-rich-quick environment, which it often is. Well, the point here is the prices keep getting lower and lower, more and more discounts, because it makes costs nothing to have somebody take the course it's already there. It's like being able to copy something for free. So it's very much like downloadable games. Of course, there's also com competition from MOOCs, which rely on university lectures and are more or less the equivalent of F2P games because they are free. So Udemy recently stopped the huge discounting, which I think they needed to do to avoid the problem that everything will become very, very, very cheap, but sales plummeted. Even my sales plummeted, and I don't participate in the kamikaze marketing. Well, they lost their nerve and restored the kamikaze marketing rather than doing some other things they could have done, and the sales went up. So the race to the bottom with discount pricing is going to be the norm for them. And in the end, I think everything will be selling for $10 or even less. That's one reason why I think subscription-based aggregation services like Skillshare and Linda will prevail over the pay-per-course sites. And uh, if you're wondering if this stuff gets pirated, yes it does. Just like downloadable games. So, in general, the inherent value or the cost to manufacture of an item has little, if anything, to do with its selling price. Consider, diamonds are cheaply made these days and have no inherent value to speak of. They cut glass good. But the natural ones still sell at dear prices because of perceived worth. The value has nothing to do with the real worth. The law of supply and demand is inexorable. We have a vast oversupply of games and it's getting worse compared to the demand. There's no technological fix for that. There's no marketing fix for that. 
prices are going to keep getting lower and lower and it'll be harder and harder for game developers to make money. The closest amelioration you have here is spend a lot of time and money marketing the game. And the games that sell a really large numbers are the ones where people have spent a lot of time and, and money marketing the game, big companies. A quote from Ryan Dancy in 2011. He's well known for the OpenGL D20 license on tabletop, and he worked for EVE Online and, and so forth. Financially speaking, no one can compete with a glut in the market. It sinks all boats because it drives the price point to zero. Unquote. That's exactly what's happening in digital, in downloadable games, although he was talking about tabletop RPGs where there's a big glut. Anything is worth what people will pay for it, no more, no less, what the market will bear. In the world where games are ones and zeros, there's no manufacturing or shipping costs. So people will pay four to five dollars for a cup of coffee in certain atmospheres, but balk at the same for a video game that they'll enjoy much longer than that coffee because they perceive a manufacturing cost for the coffee and they don't for the game. In the tabletop world, the printing and shipping of a game costs money and people perceive that cost, and so you get a different point of view about pricing. And I've mentioned piracy. Whenever it's easy to copy something, it's easy to pirate it. And piracy is rampant in electronic games, books, music, and even online courses. Now, in low pricing, Psychological research suggests that consumers show less discretion between spending 99 cents or 299 than they do when deciding whether to spend 99 cents or nothing. And I think perhaps the lesson there would be if you're going to charge anything at all, go up to 299. Don't don't fool with 99 cents. And there's a reference to where that came from. How does the second-hand market affect this? Well, this is a quotation from Richard Bartle, who is known for developing MUDs and writing books and so on. When discussing barriers that digital games still need to overcome later in the call, an interview call, Bartle said that the 20 to $25 price break gamers expect when going digital is largely due to the inability to sell it back to places like GameStop when players are finished. One of GameStop's main sources of revenue is selling used games. Quote, GameStop has previously said it wants to work with publishers in creating a secondhand market for downloadable games. Now that was 2014 and as far as I know they still haven't achieved that. Another quote and the reference Low price, particularly 99 cents, is the worst of all possible worlds. It means you don't believe enough in your game to make it free, where you only earn money if people stick around and enjoy it, or to charge a high price for it, a signal in a crowded marketplace that you believe your product is valuable. Bartle again points out the game makers don't like the FTP model. Most people working in the games industry are there because they like making games. They want you to play them because they're fun, not because they subject you to cheap psychological tricks. They want to say things through their games. They want to make money, of course, but money is a side issue." Unquote. Unfortunately, that's not how the way the market works. And as long as we're in a capitalist society, we're stuck with the market. What about YouTube's role? Well, Cliff Blazinski, Gears of War, Unreal Tournament, that's why I now believe there's a direct correlation between how good your game is and how many unique YouTube videos it can yield. Maybe amazing competitive matches or fantastic things the users have built themselves or even a crazy physics bug that was caught on a live stream." Unquote. The games that can do that or have that and can then can have Twitch or YouTube show that get a lot more publicity. And when there are lots and lots of games, 
The biggest problem is discoverability. If people don't know your game exists, or if they know absolutely nothing about your game, how can they buy it? The book Smart Pricing suggested that successful pay-what-you-want programs are characterized by a product with low marginal cost, as in something that's downloadable, a fair-minded customer, that's a problem, a product that can be sold credibly at a wide range of prices, a strong relationship between buyer and seller, and a very competitive marketplace. So pay what you want sometimes works, sometimes it doesn't, but it never makes a lot of money, I don't believe. What about the long tail? Chris Anderson has written about the long tail, an entire book, among other things. And this, his suggestion is that in the internet age, products will continue to sell in small quantities because they can still be made available online. There are many who argue that Anderson is wrong. There is a tail, but the markets are more hit-driven than ever before, and the used game market in particular helps kill the tail in gaming. Why buy a new one when you can buy a used one that works just the same and costs quite a bit less? The tail disappears in video games because there are so many games that people can only try to learn about a small portion of them, a small portion of the new ones, so they're unlikely to pay attention to the older ones. Of course, I haven't mentioned the cult of the new, but that's there as well, the belief that something that's new is better than something that isn't new. Also, there's an expectation, because it's happened so often, that older games will be discounted to nearly free. So they're not going to buy one that's still close to its original price. Sales of mobile games dry up very rapidly after release, and that's when the publishers, who are usually also the developers, go to enormous discounting and bundling. Now, I'm going far afield here, but what the heck. Comparison with online courses. Recently I watched a video from Teachable, one of the larger online course companies. They tell their instructors, quote, your knowledge is valuable, you shouldn't charge less than $100 for a course, unquote. Now where they get $100 from, I have no idea. It's a purely arbitrary figure. Why, why didn't they say $10? Why didn't they say $1,000? It's nonsense. They suggest that you calculate your price based on your revenue goals. That's a paddling, as the mighty jingles would say. That's nonsense. People don't care what your revenue goal is. And your revenue goal is, has nothing to do with what they're going to pay for your online course. Quote, you deserve to be compensated fairly, unquote. Consumers don't think that way, especially in the Internet age. They do not think in terms of fair compensation. They think about things like how else might they attain the knowledge offered in a course through free videos on YouTube, through books, which might be free, free through libraries, ebooks, local continuing ed or community ed courses, and so forth. There's no substitute for a teacher with experience of what they are teaching, but how often can you find that in a seated class, let alone an online class? Another quote, generally you can assume that at least 2% of your email list will purchase, so you can decide on pricing that way. Duh, that's one of the stupidest things I've read or heard in a long time. They might buy 2% if the price fits their expectations, but not if it doesn't. You could just as well say, well, charge $1,000, even if only 2% of your email list buys, you'll make lots of money. No, you have to ask yourself, if I wanted to learn this, would I pay X dollars for it? So, in the summary, we may be doomed by a 21st century disease, that if it costs nothing to make a copy, people are only going to pay very little for it. They don't look at the value of what's in it, or the fixed costs of creating it. They only look at, it costs you nothing to make a copy, why isn't it super cheap? Of course, there's an unspoken assumption there, we can pirate it for nothing. 
Now, the gaudy physical productions of tabletop games have the advantage that they clearly cannot be copied for nothing, though the information can, of course. And so we don't have these pricing problems in tabletop industry. So you have to figure out ways to get your money up front if you can for downloadable products such as Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and that's why, or a big reason why, those kinds of fundraising places are so popular. I have some books that derive from my online courses and I'm thinking uh, one of my possibilities is to use Kickstarter to try to get my money up front before people pirate the heck out of them. <sighs> Thanks for listening.